and deuces are high. The first explorers and fur traders to enter the mostly uncharted area of the Dakotas did so by way of the Missouri River. Most notable was the expedition of Lewis and Clark in 1804. With a few exceptions, the Indians that they met up with were friendly and quite impressive in their headdress and buffalo skins. To the white man, the Indians of the Northern Plains looked similar to each other, but in reality they were a very fragmented nation with intense rivalries and constant battles. Because of their fancy dress, the Mandan, Sioux, and Cheyenne were the Indians most often portrayed in photographs and paintings abroad. The European fascination with the American Indian prompted a German prince, Maximilian, to make a trip to the wilderness of the Dakota Sioux to study the Indian populations as early as 1833. Pictures like these were distributed to the outside world, depicting to them a proud nation of natives living in peace and harmony on sacred ground. In actuality, the Sioux did have sacred ground, the Black Hills, but they did not live in them. The hills were thought to be the abode of great spirits. During the calmest of days or nights, the Indians heard strange rumblings in certain areas of the hills and took them as omens from the thunder gods. For this reason, the Indians tread cautiously and infrequently through the Black Hills or Pahasapa as they called them. The early white explorers to the area passed by the region known for its mysterious rumblings, and they too heard the unexplainable sounds. Theories have attributed the sounds to underground beds of burning coal, but since the noises stopped in the early 1830s, no one can confirm or deny that explanation. It's interesting to note that whatever the cause of these strange noises, it has been the contributing factor for over 150 years of fierce battles between the Indians and whites that continue in the white man's court to this day. Today, the Black Hills are revered in a different way. The breathtaking beauty and diverse geography has caused the area to be a huge national forest, including a national park, two national monuments, and a national memorial. All this is protected and watched over by the government for the enjoyment and benefit of the people. Since the Black Hills are somewhat out of the way, they have become a best kept secret and many visitors casually passing through the area have quickly returned to be lifelong residents. In the last half of the 19th century, it wasn't the pretty landscape that brought migration to the Black Hills, it was gold. And the story behind the gold rush is probably one of the most interesting in U.S. history. The Indians knew that the Black Hills were rich in gold, a mostly ornamental stone with not much value to them but were warned by Father Desmet, a wandering Catholic missionary, 
to not mention the gold to the white man. Nonetheless, rumors of vast deposits of gold rippled through the West and Midwest from time to time. In 1833, a group of seven men came to the hills prospecting. Years later, a carved message was found telling of their fate. Came to them hills in 1833. Seven of us all dead but me, Ezra Kind. Killed by Indians beyond the high hill. Got our gold, June 1834. Got all the gold we could carry. Our ponies all got by the Indians. I have lost my gun and nothing to eat and the Indians hunting me. Other excursions met with the same fate, but as more became known about the Black Hills, the more the rumors increased about the vast fortunes in gold available for the taking. The more determined the gold seekers were to explore the Black Hills, the more determined the Indians became to keep them out. What was needed was a military action to establish a white presence in the sacred Pahasapa, contrary to the Fort Laramie Treaty. A debate ensued among the military and government officials. General Terry wrote a letter stating, The Sioux race placed the highest value upon the region in question. They look upon it as their last refuge from starvation. I have supposed that whites have no legal right to enter upon or occupy it. But Mr. C. Delano, Secretary of the Interior, expressed the opinion, The government will do all in its power to open the territory to the whites and extinguish the claim of the Indians. So set in motion one of the largest military shows of force and pomp in the history of the Plains Cavalry. Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer, with 1,000 men, 110 wagons, 2,000 animals, and three Gatling guns, escorted a group of scientists, geologists, and prospectors into the heart of the Black Hills to find what they might find. The caravan curved its way through the hills like a string of pearls, and while camping near present-day Custer City, the expected happened. Gold was discovered, and a courier was immediately dispatched to tell the world. What ensued was the last and most colorful gold rush in the lower 48 states. Young, strong, and perhaps naive gold seekers from the east, mixed with old, hardened, and disillusioned veterans from the California and Montana gold strikes. Throw in gunslingers from the west and south, and you have perhaps the wildest and most lawless segment of American history. In the shadow of what was eventually to be the Mount Rushmore Memorial, dozens of placer mining camps sprung up in the creek beds. At first, the gold findings were encouraging, but placer mining, which uses water to rinse through mud and fine rock to uncover small nuggets and flakes of gold, is a temporary system at best. Once an area gave out, the miners picked up and moved to another river or stream. Cities like Custer, Harney, Rockerville and Keystone began to spring up, flourish for a while, and then die out, in part or completely. The deposits of gold were in the streams, just not in the abundance thought previously, until gold was discovered in the northern hills along the Whitewood Creek in a location called Deadwood Gulch. Finally, gold was found in the quantities everyone had hoped for, and the mass migration into the area was a thing to behold. An early newspaper man in the hills wrote, the writer has witnessed many mining stampedes, many higueras from old mining caps to new ones, but never before knew so sudden, so total and complete, a depopulation of an old mining camp by a rush for a new one, as was the stampede from Custer City to Deadwood in the early spring of 1876. The 1880 census of Deadwood shows a population of over 10,000, some of the early residents of Deadwood were quite famous or became famous during this time of reckless abandon. Most notable are Calamity Jane, Potato Creek Johnny, Poker Alice, who lived mostly in Sturgis, Preacher Smith, and of course best known, James Butler Hickok, lovingly referred to as Wild Bill. Accounts of the character of Wild Bill are varied. Some say he was nothing more than a scoundrel, and others revered him as a hero. This much is known. He was a gunman who had killed many men, mostly without remorse or regret. He was quick with the gun, and feared by everyone with good sense. His aim was excellent, and his revolver sported a hair trigger. 
He came to Deadwood in the company of Calamity Jane, Colorado Charlie Utter, and others who were asked to leave Cheyenne. Much has been rumored about Wild Bill and his love affair with Calamity Jane, most of which historians cannot determine is true or false. Wild Bill had two rules he lived by. One was to pour his drinks with his left hand in order to leave the right hand free to draw. And the second was to sit with his back always to the wall as he had more enemies than friends. On August 2nd, 1876, he joined a poker game where the only chair was not against the wall. A few minutes later, he was dead, a bullet in his head and aces and eights in his hand. He was shot by a Jack McCall, a shifty drifter of no other distinction whatsoever. Deadwood continued for quite some time to be a wild and wicked town. Brothels were openly tolerated and naked women and games of chance were the trademarks of many of Main Street's saloons. In an unstated way, Deadwood still today enjoys the reputation of being slightly naughty. In the spring of 1989, Deadwood was allowed to have controlled gambling within the city limits. In 1877, over $2 million worth of gold was removed from the Deadwood area, but experienced miners and prospectors could see that the placer mines were running out. The easy gold, which had been washed down into the streams, had been picked through, but the more knowledgeable miners knew that the placer gold had to have been washed down from large veins of gold. They were up there in those hills somewhere. The hard job was to find where. Two brothers, Mose and Fred Manuel, along with Henry Harney, were the first to discover a large quartz vein of gold in the hills above Deadwood, where is situated present-day Lead. They called their new claim Homestake. As the claim was mined, it became obvious that a lot of machinery and a lot of money would be required to get the huge amount of gold out of the hills. So the founders sold the mine to a group of young entrepreneurs, one of which was George Hurst. The Homestake Mine at Lead laid the foundation for the vast Hearst fortunes of later years. Homestake is still producing gold in significant amounts and for over a century was the largest producing gold mine in North America. In the late 1870s, a railroad was built through the hills to accommodate the shipping of gold, supplies, and passengers from the railheads to the gold camps of Deadwood, Keystone, Lead, and others. still runs today and is a popular tourist attraction.
was a significant landmark for the immigrants to the Black Hills. The large dormant volcano was the first hint of the arrival to the promised land of the Black Hills and could be seen from 50 miles away. To the Indians, the strange looking mountain was extremely sacred as it was the place where visions were received which significantly shaped the religion of the Cheyenne. One might compare its stature with the Dome of the Rock for the Muslims or Bethlehem for the Christians. Today it is protected by South Dakota as a state park and each year the Indians return to perform their sacred rituals. Because of its importance to the Indians, a spot was chosen close by for a fort in order to keep an eye on the now angry Cheyenne and Sioux. The fort was named after General Meade and was home to the famous 7th Cavalry. A short distance from the fort, a town sprung up to accommodate the needs of the large number of soldiers stationed here. The town became known as Scoop Town, as it scooped the soldiers' pay with wild women gambling and booze. Later, the name was changed to Sturgis. Sturgis today is best known as the motorcycle mecca, and each year in August, close to 100,000 motorcyclists descend upon the town for a week of biking and partying. Unsuspecting tourists to the area often find themselves in the midst of a throng of bikes, making their way through the Black Hills and enjoying the beautiful sights from the seat of a Harley. Devil's Tower in Wyoming's portion of the Black Hills has a rather strange connection with Bear Butte, stemming from Indian folklore. The Cheyenne Indians believe there was a bear who stole an Indian maiden and took her off to his cave. The husband of the Indian maiden called upon his younger brother, a medicine man, for help. Take four blunt arrows, he said. Make two with eagle feathers and two with buzzard feathers. The medicine man, the grieving husband, and their five other brothers went to kill the bear. The men jumped to a rock and prayed for the rock to help them. The rock lifted them to safety and the bear clawed away the sides in vain. The Indian shot the bear with the magic arrows, the last one causing a fatal wound. The bear crawled away and died a short distance from the tower, forming the sacred mountain of Bear Butte. If viewed from the right angle and with a bit of imagination, the butte does appear like a sleeping bear. Today, Devil's Tower is a world-famous tourist attraction. Adding to its popularity was the motion picture Close Encounters of the Third Kind. The odd-looking mountain beckons in real life the adventurous or foolhardy who try to scale its craggy sides. What you are seeing is the easy way up. Devil's Tower is the core of an ancient volcano whose outer covering has eroded away. The column-like surface was the effect of the relative rapid cooling of the core. It's important to note that while there was all this hubbub going on in the Black Hills, the rest of the territory was progressing in a somewhat more orderly fashion toward taming the prairie and obtaining statehood. Homesteaders flocked into the area from overseas, lured by the promise of free land. But cultivating the prairie and withstanding the brutal elements was not easy. The popular true story of Lara Engels Wilder took place in real life on the plains of South Dakota. The books later became the basis for the TV show, Little House on the Prairie. The culture of the South Dakota plains dweller, even to this day, reflects the heritage of the old world, brought with the homesteaders and handed down from generation to generation. After the gold rush had subsided, people began to see the Black Hills for its true value, pristine beauty. 
Some of the most gorgeous vistas in America are right here in the Paja Sapa. There's an abundance of lakes, like Sylvan Lake, Legion Lake, Stockade Lake, and Lakota Lake, to name a few. Some man-made lakes and reservoirs have become scenic spots of the Black Hills as well. Pactola Reservoir and Sheridan Lake both have mining ghost towns lying under their waters. The Needles Highway in Custer State Park is breathtaking. The pigtail turns on the Iron Mountain Highway is a favorite. And Harney Peak is the highest point east of the Rockies with an elevation of 7,242 feet. Northwest of Lead is Spearfish Canyon, an out of the way place that most tourists miss, but which is gorgeous. In the middle of the canyon is the serene Rough Lock Falls. The unique geologic formations in the Black Hills have caused many caves of particular size and splendor to form. So extraordinary are these caverns that one has been made a national park and another a national monument. Now, we credit white men for discovering the, the cave itself. But before, before white men ever came to this area, the Indians knew about the hole. Although they probably didn't know much about the cave itself because they were scared to enter the hole. Um, since this area, this entire Black Hills area, is very sacred to the Lakota people, um, the spirits that live within the Black Hills are something that they fear. And I don't mean they are afraid of, but that they, they respect. So in fear of angering the spirits that lived inside the hole, they never entered. But they would have ceremonies and things in this area, and we found evidence of that. But the two white men that discovered it never entered either, and that's we're not sure, small to enter, sure why. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> but after they discovered it, it boomed. People started coming in and out of the cave all the time. And then in 1890, a young man, uh, 17 years old, discovered 10 miles or more worth of passageway all by himself. Sometimes he would have the help of, of his family members or, or friends, but um, he entered the cave on his own with a candle stick, if you can believe oh. that. <laughs> Crawled in and out of rocks, and around rocks, and started what we know as Wind Cave today. And the Indians believe that everything that lives on the earth today came from inside the earth, came from the center of the earth. And there was a great spirit that lived in this area. Okay, and probably the Indians believed he lived right here where we're standing right now. And he would give to them the buffalo and, and other prairie dogs and, and the prairies. They came this big and they grew and grew and grew as soon as they got onto the surface of the earth. And so out of that, out of that story, come the buffalo and the prairie dogs and all the things that live in the Black Hills today. Cave National Park was discovered by some cowboys who, while resting on the side of a gully, had their hats blown off from a gust of wind from an unseen cave, hence the name. This cave has been well explored and has had its formations well documented. 
Whereas Jewel Cave, believed to be the longest cave in the Western Hemisphere, has many passages still unexplored. Almost anywhere that you'll find limestone, uh, you'll find some subsurface resources, you'll find caves. What's unique about the Black Hills is that we have a limestone that has been lifted up along with the association of the uplift of the core of the Black Hills that provides an interface between the limestone and the, the surface world itself. And it's along this, be like the inside of a donut, it's along this edge of the limestone that the many cave entrances are found within the Black Hills. Uh, Jewel Cave, when it was initially discovered, um, was thought to be very similar to a lot of the other caves here in the Black Hills. It's been since the, the recent exploration, since 1959, that the uniqueness of the Jewel Cave system has really been emphasized. The Jewel Cave is unique because of the extensive lining of the walls with calcite crystal. It's one of the premier caves in, in terms of the amount of deposition of calcite crystal. But since they began active exploration of the cave in 1959, we've discovered also that it's one of the largest known cave systems in the world. Right now we have a little bit over 81 miles worth of explored and mapped passageway and that's been estimated to represent a very small portion of the possible size of the cave. Right now exploration trips are taking up to 15, 16 hours. They're very grueling. Um, it's like climbing the mountains in the Tetons. Um, they really are expeditions and it, it takes a lot of preparation and, and energy to get out to the places where we've been exploring, do some exploring and get back again. Again, we've got 81 plus miles worth of known passageway. Uh, they think that's a very small portion of it and the more we explore, the farther and farther we're gonna be getting out, the longer and longer it's gonna take to do the exploration. At the current time, we do not allow people to stay in the cave for extended periods of time. That's more of a, a safety factor is why we like to know where the people are and have them come out within a reasonable period of time. And of course, all these points are bonuses to the main reason millions of visitors come to the Black Hills each year, to see the largest artistic sculpture in the world, Mount Rushmore. The peaks and cliffs which protrude out of the velvety pine covering of the Black Hills are mostly made of super hard granite exposed by millennia of weather-driven elements. An eastern lawyer traveling to the area to examine tin mining claims for a client was impressed by a prominent outcropping of granite a short distance from Harney Peak. Asking the name of the peak, he was informed that it as yet had no name. Well, name it after me, he said. As a joke, when sending the New York lawyer some charts and maps of the area, which he needed for his work, they titled the impressive Granite Peak after his name, Charles Rushmore. The name stuck. The idea of sculpting something in one of the granite peaks in the Black Hills came from the state historian of South Dakota, Doan Robinson, in the early 1920s. His original idea was to sculpt a figure on one of the needles, a regional figure like Kit Carson or Jim Bridger. As he became more obsessed with the idea, he looked around for an artist capable of the task who might be interested in a crazy idea. Gutson Borglum was at the time working on the Stone Mountain Memorial in Georgia and was having a few disputes with the organizers. Contacted and interested in the Black Hills idea, he came out west and began scouting out possible locations. Any of the needles were immediately out of the running as the granite was not hard enough and not big enough. Gutson started changing the idea right away. It must be a national memorial rather than a regional one. And the scope of the project must be big enough to withstand any political or financial opposition. A forest ranger suggested the large granite surface of Mount Rushmore. And after careful study and artistic inspiration, the sculptor concluded that the mountain would be the home of a new and grandiose national monument. The mountain was located in a very isolated but scenic portion of the hills. No roads led up to the peak and could be reached only on foot or horseback. The great senator from South Dakota, P. 
Peter Norbeck became excited about the project and undertook the giant task of getting the federal government to back the project both financially and emotionally. Pending that, some local money was obtained and preliminary work began in 1925. This great endeavor encompassed many disciplines of science and art. Gutson first created the scope and feeling of the project with artistic inspiration by drawings and then models. From small clay models, larger mache scale mock-ups were produced with considerable effort, and then overcoming the immense physical problem of translating the art of the model to a huge granite behemoth, utilized skills of geology, geometry, mathematics, chemistry, physics, and seat-of-your-pants imagination. Gutson had a studio built at the base of the mountain with large windows, which offered an unobstructed view of the project. Many changes occurred during the carving of the mountain, some for artistic reasons, but most to overcome some physical problems with the mountain. The actual blasting and drilling on the mountain began in 1927 with a dedication speech by Calvin Coolidge. He said, We have come here to dedicate a cornerstone that was laid by the hand of the Almighty. It is but natural that such a design should begin with George Washington, for with him begins that which is truly characteristic of America. He added later, the people of the future shall see art and history combined to portray the spirit of patriotism. The original design was for Washington's head to be in the middle flanked by Jefferson on his right and Lincoln on his left. Gutson Borglum was a perfectionist in his art and could see that the Jefferson head placed on the right hand of Washington would not be the best composition. From the new construction of the Iron Mountain Road, the tunnel would frame Jefferson with the back of his head showing. To Borglum, it just wouldn't work, and he ordered the face blown away to the horror of his associates. The scope of such a work of art and engineering was unprecedented, and Gutson had to therefore proceed by trial and error. The workers, for the most part, were abnormally skilled and suited for such work, as most of them were miners before the claims started to run out. The diligence and dedication of the workers on Mount Rushmore cannot be overstated. It's interesting to note that although historians suggest that Mount Rushmore was carved, there was really very little carving done. The rock was shaped and designed by dynamite, jackhammers, and tamping machines. The fact that such a striking resemblance to the four presidents portrayed could be obtained by such unsubtle instruments is truly amazing. Borglum became famous as an entire nation followed the progress of the shrine. Orators proclaimed him the foremost artist in the universe in colossal portraiture. Problems with cracks in the granite caused the sculptor to revise the design for Jefferson and to blast away the granite and sink the face 60 feet back from Washington's. On August 30th, 1936, this face and the new design was unveiled. The Lincoln figure went more smoothly and was unveiled September 17th, 1937. By this time, the skeptics had been silenced, and the magnitude and majesty of Borglum's accomplishment had made him a famous and powerful man. He had already made the decision to add a fourth face to the rock. And for the honor, Gutson chose a personal favorite, the trust-busting president, Teddy Roosevelt. The final head was revealed on July 2nd, 1939, and was broadcast by CBS on its new television network. In March of 1941, Gutson Borglum died, a few months short of the project's ultimate completion, but he lived long enough to see the most important work accomplished. His son Lincoln finished the project with some detail work. Two interesting parts of Borglum's work have never been completed. He planned a great staircase and a hall of records in back of the memorial. The hall of records was started but never completed. Senator Norbeck was perhaps best known for his tireless work gaining support for the Mount Rushmore Memorial, but he was also very active in establishing the Badlands as a national monument. At first, the Congress thought Senator Norbeck was a little crazy for trying to protect and set aside the Badlands. After all, it was truly bad land. 
The early French fur trappers referred to it as mauvaise terre à traverser, which means bad land to cross, and deemed the area of no real value and left it alone. Of course, that isn't to say the early traveler to the area didn't appreciate the sullen beauty of this bizarre landscape. Many early explorers spent considerable time wandering the labyrinths of the hard-packed clay mountains, trying to describe the almost indescribable to the outside world. Jedediah Smith, the famous Western explorer, just about died of thirst along with the rest of his party as they tried to pass through the Badlands area in 1823. The reason for the strange geologic formations stems from frost, rain, and other forces of erosion upon a muddy clay earth, which was once the bottom of a prehistoric ocean. As these forces, still active today, cut through the soil, treasures of fossilized plants and animals are laid bare. The White River Badlands is one of the foremost fossil beds in the world, and an impressive display of bones collected from the area was established at the South Dakota School of Mines and Technology in Rapid City. The Badlands are not lifeless, far from it. Back in the late 1800s, bighorn sheep, wolves, elk, bison, and even grizzly bears roamed the plateaus and valley floors. These species were exterminated from the area by man in the early 1900s, but the Park Service has reintroduced the sheep and bison to the park. There's some sad and poignant history to the Badlands, which adds to its charm and its name, the Badlands. As the white man rushed into the Black Hills, eastern Wyoming, and the northern plains of the Dakotas, the Indians were pushed onto smaller and more desolate tracts of land. The Badlands were one of the last areas taken from them, and plays a sad role in the final massacre of the Sioux. As the Indians became more and more oppressed by the whites, there arose a new doctrine of their religion prophesied by a Paiute Indian named Wovoka. He promised a new world would be established in 1891 when the Great Spirit would sweep the white man off the land. The Indians would be lifted up into the clouds and the buffalo would once again roam the prairie. At the heart of this new religion was the ghost dance and about 600 warriors went into the Badlands to dance the dance and follow the rituals which would make them invincible to the whites. The Indians placed upon themselves a white garment which they believed would protect them from bullets. The dancers holed up at the sheltering place or Oona Gosher. The famous artist Frederick Remington was with a group of soldiers and Indian agents as they tried to force the Indians out of their stronghold. It was 12 miles through the defiles of the Badlands to the Blue Ridge of the High Mesa where the hostiles had lived. The trail was strewn with dead cattle, some of them having never been touched with a knife. Here and there a dead pony ridden to a standstill and left nerveless on the trail. No words of mine can describe these Badlands. They are somewhat as Doré pictured hell. One set of buttes with cones and minarets gives place in the next mile to natural freaks of a different variety never dreamed of by mortal man. The painter's whole palette is in one bluff. A short while later, the troops met up with the Indians on the banks of the Wounded Knee River. The Indians were outnumbered two to one and had women and children in their company. As the Indians were surrendering their arms, a gunshot was heard, and a few moments later, 200 Indian men, women, and children lay dead in the snow. The Wounded Knee Massacre was the last armed skirmish between the whites and Indians and remains the low point of Indian and military history. Bill Husted, lifelong resident of the Badlands area and owner of the world famous Wall Drugstore. At the, at the late 1800s, this was all open range. This was the Indian reservation out here and it was the last open range in, in America. And of course, the big Texas cattle outfits came into the, the railhead was uh, across the Missouri. And they uh, swam their cattle across the river and they made deals with the chiefs, the Sioux Indian chiefs to run 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, they had a cattle in, in this part of South Dakota, western South Dakota. It was the last open range in America. The inhospitable terrain in the Badlands made it a favorite robber's roost for rustlers and the like until the government opened it up to the Homestead Act. With the advent of the railroads, which ran very close to the north and south of the Badlands, many thought the area could be fruitful for raising cattle or perhaps farming. So the railroads uh, advertised uh, free land, and the railroads mainly were looking for traffic, uh, the Chicago Northwestern and the Milwaukee Road, to bring people out to western South Dakota. Land of opportunity out here, free land. And uh, of course, I think everybody that uh, uh, always in their heart wanted to own a piece of ground of their own. On this side of the White River, in the Badlands, as we know the Badlands now, in the park, there were homesteaders up in the Tyree Basin. They, they didn't have a prayer. There was no way to make a living there. The homesteaders soon found that the weather and elements in the area are torturous, complete with lightning set wildfire, baseball-sized hail, and grasshopper plagues. To homestead, one had to pay $18 in fees to receive 160 acres, on which you had to live for five years and cultivate 10 acres. The saying was, the government bet you 160 acres against $18 that you would starve to death before you lived on the land five years. The few towns that sprang up in the Badlands because of the railroads didn't last long, and with only a few notable exceptions, the homesteaders were all beaten by this God-forsaken land. An old cowboy told me that he remembers riding in there. There was a family and four kids. And he said that he rode in there one time to get a, a drink of water because they did have a shallow well right in the creek. And he said those people, he felt as he was looking around that those people, not only were the kids sick, and some of them had diphtheria, but he said he thought possibly they were starving. That's how bad it was. As one homesteader put it, it was easy to move on. I had nothing left. All I had to do was put out the fire and whistle for my dog. The Dust Bowls of the 30s put an end to most of the hangers on. And in 1939, the federal government bought most of the private lands left and put them under the supervision of the National Park Service. Today, the Badlands National Park covers 244,000 acres. The Mammoth Site is a world-famous trapping fossil bed comparable to the La Brea Tar Pits. This important find brings in paleontologists from all over the globe to this site near Hot Springs. The, the sinkhole uh, was discovered, or the bones were discovered, uh, because the land on top of it, which is really a hill at the time, was being moved to fill the gullies to the south of us for a housing development project. This sinkhole was formed when the soft uh, material below this area was washed out by subterranean water levels, and as a result, we had a slump or a karst sinkhole. Uh, I call it a prehistoric stock dam, but it was a hole that was formed due to the uh, erosion of the material underneath it. I think the thing that makes it very unique is that over time, uh, before the sinkhole fell up, uh, a lot of mammoth fell in. We think that there are at least 100 individual mammoth that have fallen into the sinkhole. The thing that makes it unique is that in most other places you, where you find a mammoth, it's a scavenger kill or a floodplain. Here they've never been disturbed. And so when you find them, uh, the material around the scientific information is very accurate because they have not been washed away or changed in time. I think the thing that makes this site different than the La Brea tar pits, there, both of them were trapping actions. But in the La Brea tar pits, you have the skeletons, the very nature of the chemistry of the petroleum, uh, the hydraulic pressure prevented, uh, the pollens and other things that you find here. Uh, this hole, being a water system, was able to collect the pollen and the sand granules and all the things that tell climatic conditions. In fact, if you take a look at the uh, ledge behind me, you'll find thousands of layers of sediment uh, that tell you whether it's a wet season or a dry season, uh, the amount of moisture because of the size of the granules of the sediment, many things of that nature that's really a detective story. Because of that, the scientific community is looking to this site for uh, us to preserve it so that they will have a point in time to compare the uh, ecological conditions of 26,000 years ago with things that are happening now. The state capital of South Dakota is in Pierre, 
located on the beautiful Missouri River. Originally, the territorial capital was in Yankton. It moved briefly to Huron, but upon being admitted to the Union as a state in 1889, the seat of state government was moved to a centralized location on the Missouri River. The Missouri River has always played a big part in South Dakota's history, first as a navigational route, and later as a provider of irrigation water, drinking water, and hydroelectric power. The Owahi Reservoir, located near Pier, is one of the largest earthen dams in the United States and not only generates the majority of the electricity for the state, but provides a tremendous recreation area behind its dam. South Dakota has been described as the land of infinite variety and contrasting the rich heritage of the plains dweller and the exciting and poignant history of the Black Hills to the stark and awesome beauty of the Badlands, one can readily see that the description is more than a cliché. an enigma, a small and often overlooked state that has contributed as much to this nation's patriotism as any other. There's Mount Rushmore, called the Shrine of Democracy, and recognized worldwide, and then Fort Meade, which was the birthplace of the Star-Spangled Banner and headquarters of the famous 7th Cavalry. This small state, although rich in history, is more often known as the answer to trivia questions, such as, how do you pronounce the capital of South Dakota, or where is Mount Rushmore located? Regardless, the people of South Dakota are proud of their heritage, their history, and their place in our society after a hundred years of statehood. <laughs> 